Okay, guys, let's get this video going right away. It's a little bit longer one. I'm so pumped. Let's get these gas tanks done, get some more done on the wings. This wingless crazy aircraft scrappy has got to get some wings on it. I need it flying. I can't wait to show you more all about it. Also, I got the greatest gift from the United States Air Force. So let's get right at it. Back to work. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. So we just flipped this over. We've drilled all the holes out from a little tiny, tiny hole that was just a pilot hole so we could flush drill the recessed back plate with the nut plates to this so that any intolerances are evened up. We drilled them, pulled it apart, sanded, deburred it, put it back together. Now, I've got a bunch of different sets of these. This is a dimple die. It makes a dimple, and I have some that are for doing one sheet, two sheets, 50, uh, 050, 025. I got a whole bunch of different sets. I've got this one set up and torqued to pinch together the holes and actually dimple both sheets of 025 at the same time so that I can put a flush rivet in. And it's actually a stronger joint because when you take two sheets and you dimple them together to pull them apart, the sheets are actually interlocked in a dimple and then also the rivets are flush. So it's just better aerodynamically. It's a lot more work, but overall it's that last 10% makes 90% of the difference of a finished product. All right guys, here's what we're doing now. I'm kind of gonna show you an assembly one end to the other. Each one of these ribs, almost every single one of them in this aircraft are custom and different. There's some easy changes to notice like hinge bracket ones with pressed in uh, bearing bronze inserts, uh, but others that look exactly the same like these two are actually different. The thickness of the metal here on a barrier between um, slosh guards is thin. The end of the tank, this one is much thicker. You can actually kind of hear it. I don't know if you can tell, but it's twice as thick as the end of the tanks. And then also the end of the tank doesn't have slots that will allow these parts to slide down the gas tank internal ribs. So these ones can all slide down, but this one, when we put it on, you just slide it till it hits the end and stops dead. And it, everything is precision cut on either laser or CNC for every part of this so far. So as these slide down, you can see we get to this phase and as we assemble it, they'll drop into these race tracks that are all machined. They had numbers engraved into them and that will drop and then we just slide the ribs until they lock into here. They only have a few thousands clearance on each side. So once they drop in, we know every one of the rivet lines are perfect. And then if you come on down here, you can see what it looks like as we get done. We flip it over, start putting in all the Clecos, the bottom skin of the gas tank is thicker than the other skins. I have about four different thicknesses of skin depending on the loads, the stresses, with the tank, without a tank, near a tip. But this one right here is 50 thousandths. It's really thick. But you can see these ones I'm able to countersink because the material of the skin is thick enough to allow it. In other areas I use a dimple die that dimples it and the piece underneath it. So these are countersunk. They're ready to go. But this gas tank you can't even put it together out of square. It's literally precision perfect. This is an example of how this works, where I preset all the locations of the ribs. I don't even have to measure it. I just slide it, drop it. This side drops in. It drops between its insets. And you can see how you can't get it out of measurement. Everything auto aligns. And then you can see the thickness of this tab comes up to the thickness of the bottom L shape into this rib so that when the parts all connect, there's no gap anywhere and everything when it rivets together makes a perfect line. It doesn't step up and down with skin thicknesses you sometimes see on wings. So, so far so good, back to work. Okay, let's pause the build for just a second. I wanna give you an update some of you have asked and thank you for your patience. The little wing spar kits of the different sizes of wing spars that the cubs are made out of, what Scrappy's custom cub is made out of, the engraving of Scrappy. Those of you who ordered that and the card of the stress loads we're sending, stickers and everything else. 
They're finally gonna start shipping in the next week. They're gonna go out in the order we got them. And I just wanna let you know, there were some challenges to keep the price at the 50 bucks we committed. Of course, I would take a loss if I had to, to honor that price. But we ended up having to find some water jet guys that would squeeze it between other jobs to help save some money. And then also the anodizers are doing the same thing, squeezing it in. Every couple of days, we get another little box that we can start shipping, and we're gonna do that. Those of you who kind of ordered at the end or just barely or now, um, there are spar sizes that are on back order. They are coming, so those will be a little later. We, we, we will get them to all of you. Thank you so much. I just want to give you an update. We love you guys. We're going to start shipping. Back to work. So let me show you how this all comes together. It might make more sense now, the little shim I put under here. If I lift this up, you can see the space where this drops in and that literally kind of snap locks in. And what that really is, is the fact that I wanted this 50,000th carryover strap on top and beneath to carry through and keep everything perfectly true and drop into that groove and then fill the gap. Since right now, if you look at this, there's a 50,000th step between here and this shelf right here. And so what I'll do now, just like I did on the bottom here with these, on the top skin, they're already pre-marked, laser set, I'll put in another set of shims that go across here and fill these voids up to this level. It also thickens this joint and they all get three riveted together. And then the glue joint comes in on the back side. What that allowed me to do is keep the rear of the tank one long piece rather than a piece, a piece, a piece, and a piece. And everything locks in. So, so far so good. I've got the measurement. I need to set forward and back on this right here. I've got the measurement to the third decimal. I'll get this one set with calipers and go down each one. Once they're set, I can drill the whole thing out, countersink it, and get it ready for rivet. So you guys know the drill. Back to work. All right, so we're getting closer on this tank. We've got all the bottom drilled out, countersunk. The rivet's all holding it together. We still got to disassemble it completely and deburr it. But you can see how nice and tight everything's going. This tube right here is a very tight fit. This will get bonded in. The ends, I actually have it, oh, turned it too far in there. This end is designed to sit out a half inch and I've machined a, a billet aluminum ring that comes on the end so that I can get an inch of glue all the way around the outside and up the pipe and the ring will slide on, twist on the pro seal, rivet in, and then I'll do the same on the inside so that there's a glue joint compression with not just the glue in the seam, but the glue of two capped ends that have an inch of glue both directions. It will never leak. But this pipe doesn't do any turning or movement. Inside of it will be a torque tube, a half inch smaller diameter that passes through that manipulates all the uh, This small tube you see here will have the same end uh, bond joint uh, ring. It's like a an L-shaped washer donut, I guess, that goes on here. It has it on both ends. This is the pass-through cable that goes to both sides of the plane out to the aileron. So cable, torque tube, we're getting close. Let's get back to work. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go over some of the basics of putting rivets together while we're about ready to put this in on the gas tank. Now the gas tank, we've already sealed out all the joints and the ribs that are done on it, but I wanted to talk about the skin just a little bit. Um, a lot of people asked a lot of questions about how I do it, when I decide to use dimple dies versus countersinking with a bit, and um, how to do the tank seal. Now, uh, a lot of stuff I assume is common sense, but I'll give you one of the ones that came up on one of my last videos. And just to make sure you all know, Whenever you're connecting any kind of a tank with any kind of a sealer, you wanna do it wet and keep it wet through the whole process. So sometimes there's some of the sealers that are air dry and they'll seal off way too fast and you can never finish a project this big. So you've gotta to go to another sealer that takes 24, 48 hours or more to, to cure up because you don't want the, the skim coat on the top to get dry at all. You want to stay wet during the whole process. So because this has so much going on, we're gonna use a type of Pro Seal. 
You can actually dilute it if you want to go between thin metals so that you don't get bulging. Now on this application, I'm not going to dilute it. I'm going to flip this over. I'm going to do the other side. And rather than diluting the material, I'm going to keep it thick. But I'm going to put down some yellow tape. And it's only a couple thousandths of an inch thick. And I'm going to trace out everywhere the seal needs to be. I'll bead it on, smear it on with my thumb, and then I'll take a squeegee and I'll pull it tight against it and drag off all I can. But you're not taking it off and you'll never see the aluminum show up. You're only taking it down to a couple thousandths of an inch thick and you're making sure there's no waves or imperfections from when you rubbed it or the bead. You want it to be perfectly true and spending that extra time is very visible at the end. It's easy to see a wing that someone doesn't spend that time and they put rivets in and if it wasn't thin enough viscosity of glue or they didn't blade down to the thickness of a tape line, um, when they put the rivets in, it starts to make little bows in the bottom of the wing and it works, it seals, it's fine. I'm not picking on it, but if you spend just a little more time when you put all the rivets in, you won't get the little waves between the joints. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. Also, the common mistake that gets made um, is the depth to set a rivet. So I've got this rivet set and I have a tool and you can turn just one click at a time and there's probably 60 teeth around the thing. So one click almost doesn't change the depth of the cutting tool hardly at all. And I will do test pass and I'll end up chilling 30 or 40 holes and when this rivet goes in, a lot of people think that the best method, and, I, and there's lots of methods out there, I'll tell you what I like. A lot of people think that the best method is to get the head of the rivet exactly flush with the sheet metal on how far you drill your countersink or how deep you set your, your dimple die. I actually think the best method is to have the rivet head hold up about one to two thousandths of an inch. That's about half the thickness of a thin piece of paper. The reason for that is oftentimes, I'll try to exaggerate it a little bit. If you over drill off a rivet, dimple it down and you over drill it, you put this in and the rivet sits just below the skin. But then you go and you run your impact and you close it. What it actually does is shoves the rivet back up flush with the skin and it looks perfect but it's not what happens if you over drilled your dimple is that the rivet slides up and hits the head of your either squeeze tool or your impact tool and it takes it up and it leaves that two thousandths of an inch gap between the underside of the rivet and the skin that is your guaranteed future smoking rivet a smoking rivet is when a rivet looks perfect but when you fly, there's a, just a little vibration in that joint and you'll get a little aluminum chafing line coming out of your plane down the road. So what I actually like to do is keep testing it with a really thin piece of paper, slide it over it, and I want it to look and feel perfect, but I want the paper to hit it and just barely touch it. Then when I glue it together and squeeze it, uh, the head compresses in a little bit, goes flush or is slightly high but when you paint it, that first coat of paint is enough to just sand across and have that rivet completely disappear. So um, a whole lot of talking, we got a lot of work to do. So let's go ahead. I've got all this pre-drilled, 50 thousandths of an inch thick bottom skin, only this thick where the wing is. So it's thick. I was able to drill a countersink on thinner material, like an 015, 020, 025. A lot of this wing has 032 and 025, depending on where it is on the wing. Those get a little bit thin, you have to do a dimple die, but uh, I won't get into all that. We have a lot of work to do. All right guys, now what I'm doing here, covering up the backside because I'm gonna be putting on the tank sealer and using a spreader to push the tank sealer down to the thickness of a piece of tape. But I don't want it gluing out onto my table, but more than that, once I squeegee the glue on the backside, I wanna flip it over and grab this tape and pull it off and it will pull out the glue and leave a nice clean finish, but it's gonna leave a trace of glue in every single rivet hole, and that glue won't dry until tomorrow and days later. But while I'm riveting it, there'll just be a little bit of tank sealer in every rivet, and then I need to have all the rivets done and tightened 
while that's all still wet. Okay, moment of truth. The lightweight wing, <laughs> unbelievable. Even with all the slosh bays in it, it's the heaviest part of my wing. But now, this should basically fit in like a tongue and groove slot because I've got everything marked. Let me slide it back into its notches. Slowly lower it down. And snap lock. Everything tongue and grooves, all the steps. So uh, let's throw some Clicos in it, back to work. Hi Ron. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if you don't want to hear about tank sealers, joints, how I did it, what I'm doing. The answer is yes, you just have to be a genius. Um, skip ahead like five to seven minutes because it's going to be really boring. But we're going to talk about how I did the tanks and how I seal it and how other people might do it. Actually, let me grab my whiteboard. This has been a long time coming anyway. I had one little setback. It's not a setback, I'm just a little bummed. I really wanted to keep... <laughs> there's a jet going by. Squirrel! <laughs> Squirrel! Where was it? <laughs> anyway, I really wanted to keep all the inside of my wing, the raw aluminum look, because I love it. And so I started assembling a lot of the pieces with a clear uh, aluminum um, primer protector between all my layers. And I was going to keep everything clear coated. Um, and it was really just for looks during assembly, I guess, and working on it, I just wanted to see the raw aluminum. And then I ran out of clear, and then I called to get some more, and they're on back order for six weeks, which there's no way I'm gonna stop six weeks. So I called up, order, ordered several cases of the zinc chromate green, and quite frankly, it's going a lot better. I am now gonna not recommend trying a clear, even though that looks good during assembly because I really was starting to struggle and having to put tape everywhere I had already clear primered and the ones I had it, and it was hard to tell. So I started to worry if a tape fell off apart or not. So ultimately now I'm talking to myself into the fact that I love the green, the zinc chromate works well. So here's the tank you can see, I do not have any zinc chromate in the tank and I never would. I also will never do zinc chromate between any bond that is the skin or a rib or an end bay, anywhere I want to bond two pieces of aluminum that is part of the tank. I always want to use tank sealer, a nice rough finished aluminum, and put the tank sealer wet between the joints and bond it together. Now, the reason I will only do it that way is I have seen in the past where zinc chromate was put on a part and then they put the tank sealer and they bonded it together. Now, every time you fly, things are flexing. 
The tank sealers are infinitely flexible. They stay flexible forever. That's the intent. And so when you have sealer, aluminum sealer, tank sealer, and aluminum, anytime that is flexing on the wing, you always have two fle a flexible contact point to the aluminum. But if you put zinc or a chromate or any type of primer between that bond, it should hold up pretty well and it's still used quite a bit. For me, and more commonly being done a lot, is to never do that because you're adding one more point where you could pop the primer or the zinc chromate off. If you ever play with zinc chromate, you can get your fingernail and work it and it will come off. So um, I masked everything off and you can see all the joints inside the tank is raw aluminum to tank sealer, riveted together. All the rivets need to be installed while it's wet. That's any type of a tank joint. Then while it's still wet, that's your first layer of protector to make a fuel tight tank. But while it's still wet and after all the rivets are in, then I go through and mask it off and put the next layer of tank sealer over top of the rivets and back at least a quarter inch past every joint. So you can see that's done now and that I've masked off this to get it ready for the tank lid. So before I put this fuel tank lid on, I'll mask off the area of the tank. I will go a quarter inch past any of the end joints and tape it off so it stays raw aluminum. I'll sand it, prep it, clean it. I'll mask that off, paint the zinc chromate. I do want the chromate or some type of a primer or bond or sealer between the aluminum in case so that water can't get in there or that if water does get in that joint you have uh, zinc chromate on both sides or some kind of a sealer. So that's the process. And then the fun part is I got to go through the holes from the bottom and then put the additional layer of tank sealer on all the seams, all the rivet heads. These big holes should make it nice. Then after that, there's one more layer of tank sealer and it's a little bit controversial. No, 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 no. It's not at all what you think. Um, I'm going to prep to put it in, but really I've got two barriers for fuel protection right now and that has been used for a long time and worked great. Sometimes, and back in a lot of Citation jets, they would then, after this area was done, they would brush a tank sealer on all of the, the aluminum walls and skins. Now, you gotta really, really prep the tank well because they have had Citations literally have complete flame outs where the tank sealer, after several years, started coming off. The thin coat tank sealer started coming off the walls. It would go down and it would clog all your fuel filters. So if you're going to do the next layer of tank sealer, you need to make sure you really, really prep it well. And that's something you really want to do. Or make sure that you can open up your tank and inspect for any type of corrosion anywhere. Um, any type of tank that might have low spots that could have water traps that won't sump out with your water sump becomes a more critical area. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and fill this tank up with the two layers of uh, protection. And when I get the lid on it, and I'm gonna make sure there's no leaks at that point before I do a third layer over top of that covering everything. Uh, that way I know that anything I've done so far doesn't leak and the third layer is the next layer of protection. I don't want, I'd be worried if there was some pinhole I missed and the thin layer that went over everything to protect the aluminum on the sides was the only thing protecting an area I missed. Okay, yes, I, I understand. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and skin it, fill it, leak test it, drain it, clean it, and then seal the inside with another layer. So holy crap. Probably bored the crap out of you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm going to get back to work. What I've done now is I'm just trimming up where the wing struts come together and meet so that they can come really close together. I've cut the angles I need. I'm going to flat plate it and weld it in, even though most people just leave it open-ended. 
I'm gonna go ahead and close that out. Um, what's great is I'm able to use uh, the heavy duty wing struts. And instead of using a rear strut, the, the main front strut is way overbuilt for what I need to handle, even with Scrappy's loads and weight limits I needed. So I don't need to use anything other than a heavy duty strut on the front. The rear struts though, however, weren't quite what I wanted for the loads I'm carrying on Scrappy. So I'm using two front struts and tying them together. And then right where you enter in the aircraft on the other side, um, there's an edge I've smacked with my shin a few times. And so I've trimmed off the back side where you walk in and I'm just making a rounded radius edge, just enough. Right where I kept hitting my shin, I'm just putting a little radius on it, gonna weld it, grind it out smooth, just save that black and blue. But anyway, getting close on the wing struts. I'm really happy about it. Um, it's all drawn in the computer, so hopefully we'll get it done, welded, finished, trim, sanded, adjust the lengths, lock them down based on what the computer says. And hopefully it all goes right, well, it just bolt the wing up and have no adjustments to make. But we do have adjustments on the rod ends to fine tune the twist or anything else needed, but we're getting close. Let's get back to work. <laughs> All of you who send me letters and gifts and support me, thank you so much. I just received one that just kind of sent me back and blew me away. And I want to share it with you and read it from the United States Air Force with an American flag. And apparently a bunch of these guys overseas are watching these silly videos of mine and the aircraft I love to build sent me this. So I'm gonna read it to you real quick. This is the certified that the accompanying American flag was flown on the 14th day of February, 2021 in your honor aboard the C-130H aircraft during combat support missions in Kuwait and Iraq. This flag is presented to Mike Patey Flown on behalf of J.D. Lindsay, the men and the women of the 779th Airlift Squadron of the crew of Chrome 91 while deployed supporting America's war on terrorism through Operation Freedom's Sentinel. Holy cow, guys. For all of you who thought to do this and send me this flag, I love, freaking love you guys. This means so much to me, and uh, I love our country. I'm a patriot. I am red, white, and blue all the way through. I can't wait to frame this and put this up, and there's no way you're getting away with um, sending me something like this without me trying to send something back in return, and I know it can't hold the candle to this, but for this whole squadron, I was thinking about it, and I've just decided I'm going to take this this formation of the C-130s, which are the coolest plane. It's just a beast of an aircraft out serving our country. So I'm so excited. I'm gonna put this exact image on a shirt and then send a bunch of shirts, whatever it takes to get this squadron and all these guys shirts that just say, I support our troops. This may be a back to work. Mike Patey, probably put an American flag on the side let these guys know that I support them and I love them for this. Uh, all of you men and women, women serving in our country, current and past, thank you. It's unbelievable. I don't know what to say about it. So I haven't made any yet, but we're gonna put a design together. I was talking, describing it to Ron and my son and a few others. Now they want a couple of them. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw it on my website. I don't have any made. I don't know. Uh, we're gonna figure out how many I need to make for all these guys. And then if any of you want it, I'm gonna hurry and throw it on my website. I'll put some pictures up because we'll design something right away and get it on this video. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw that up. Uh, if any of you wanna join me in wearing a shirt that says, I support our troops. I don't think that I can get the orders in, get this video out and get the orders created since we're gonna build, make them to suit and get them out by the 4th of July. But we'll just do it and get them out as fast as we can. So thank you, all of you that are fighting for our country, our freedoms. Um, I love our country. <laughs> so all of you, thanks. Let's get back to work.